is on annotation with the ML22. Um, it's fairly nuts and bolts oriented, and I hope I've left enough time for questions. Um, it's okay with me if you want to chime in in the middle and say, I'd, I'd please explain that a little differently, or uh, that's perfectly fine. Um, go right ahead. <clears throat> and you all can see the screen okay? Whoops. Yes. There. Um, okay. I have to get my... I have to get my cursor in the right place to advance slides. So um, I'll talk a little bit about the advantages of annotation in general and the kinds of improvements they can make. Um, and then I'm gonna cover these topics. I'll spend a few minutes reviewing the ways annotation can be stored in EML. Um, I'll show you what the, how the EML structures connect to RDF triples um, because those are what drives this concept of linked open data. And then I'll give you some examples of the current support for EML annotations at repositories and talk about ontologies in general. And then um, you know, what different types of vocabularies are good for, at different, for different kinds of annotations and um, the workflows that we anticipate people using as they do this. And then um, we're also planning for a workshop um, pretty soon um, where we'll actually put some of this to work. <clears throat> okay, so why annotate? Um, you probably all have seen this analogy before, and you've heard the story. The amount of data in repositories is, is growing. The sort of diversity of collection methods, organisms, and environments, and the resulting measurements, <clears throat> excuse me, has been a major impediment to discovery and understanding. And outside of a few controlled monitoring programs like EPA, there are very few existing dictionaries that can be used to actually describe measurements, but semantics works can address that gap. A typical search might be based on strings like red and white um, or a person, but that doesn't help you when the landscape looks like this Where's Waldo book. A semantic search though can help you find things like people wearing red t-shirts with horizontal red and white stripes. And so annotation is what drives those searches. So again, what do, how do um, annotations do this? They are really good at finding synonymous concepts. Assume that one data set uses a phrase like carbon dioxide flux and another one uses CO2 flux. An information system can recognize through the annotations that those data sets are actually about the same concept if they've been identified with the same identifier. Annotation can disambiguate the terms. If the data sets have been annotated, the system can help provide only the results that are relevant to your intended meaning. So if you are searching for data sets about litter, as in plant litter, other irrelevant terms might also be labeled as litter, like garbage, or a group of animals born together, and those can be eliminated from your search results. And this is because each distinct type of litter would be associated with a different identifier. And the hierarchies can help with that disambiguation as well. The two types of litter would probably be found in different hierarchies as well as having different IDs. So you can drill up and down in a hierarchy. If you search for data sets containing carbon flux measurements, the data set annotations have, uh, or data sets annotated as having measurements of carbon flux or CO2 flux would be both be returned because these are both types of carbon flux. <clears throat> and this is possible because those concepts come from a structured vocabulary where carbon dioxide flux is lower in the hierarchy than carbon flux. So annotations are the mechanism for holding links to these external vocabularies. So they can be high, the vocabularies themselves are highly structured, community better than machine readable. So the semantic annotation enables other kinds of, oh, excuse me. So they're the mechanism for holding these links. They're used to construct the RDF triples, which are what drives linked open data and they're readable by machines. So, whoops, this, this advances very quickly, <laughs> just on a click. I don't have to put an arrow at all. Um, the latest version of EML came out two or three months ago, or actually a little longer than that, it was September. Um, one of the features that it's supported now is for semantic annotation. So this is the basic structure of an EML annotation. It's pretty simple, has only two child elements, and both are required. Now I'll show you some examples of where these go. So just one little quick, one more example of an annotation. You can have this same annotation where it uses um, on, on, this, on these two different attributes, 
one that uses the term micromoles carbon CO2, or actually doesn't even use that, it's all run together in a, in a, um, a, a compressed string, and CO2 flux rate, flux rate. But if the curators have tagged these attributes with the URI for carbon dioxide flux, then it would be clear that they refer to the same type of measurements. Whereas with a string, you would never really be sure. So there's five places in EML now that you can put an annotation. First, the annotation element can be a child of several of the main elements. At, at each of these, <clears throat> it will apply to everything below it in the hierarchy. So these are at the top. Um, what we call the resource level, and we're going to just use data set because that's what we're focusing on today, plus entity and attribute. Um, I can make a little pointer, I think. You see my cursor? Okay. Somewhere. I don't know where the pointer is. I'll look for it later if we need it. <clears throat> um, and you can also group together annotations together. You can put them in two places as a group under an annotations plural element, or you can put them under additional metadata. In both of these cases, you will use a reference element containing a node identifier to specify which EML element the annotation belongs with. And this is similar to the way that other internal references work in EML and to the way that units are referenced. But we're gonna concentrate on just two of these, which give us a pretty high return for the effort. So this is the first one. Um, data sets can have, so on the, on the left, you see what EML 2.1 looks like, which is what most of you are used to. Um, you see that data sets can have keywords. Um, and in 2.2, over here on the right, those terms could be much more explicit and they can include the identifier to a complex external vocabulary as an annotation. So these are much more powerful than simple keywords. The general, whoops, the general rule is that annotations should have unique identifiers or URIs. So if all you have is a term, then it belongs in a keyword. It does not belong in an annotation. And here's an example of the second area that we're going to concentrate on. This would be an attribute level annotation. Um, so this is an annotation of a, of a measurement. On the left, again, is the old EML 2.1 attribute. Um, where really all you have is a definition and an attribute name. And over here on the right is the 2.2 version where there also is an annotation element that describes what kind of a measurement and, and its value. Now, as I said, um, oh, I think I didn't say, um, any element that is going to be annotated must have an ID attached to it. In this example, you'll see that the 2.2 element it does. It has this attribute ID DSID 01.01. That, that's not present in the 2.1. And the EML 2.2 parser checks this now. And you'll see why that's necessary in a moment. <clears throat> so what I want to show you now is how EML structures connect to RDF triples. How's my time? Oh, I'm good. And because these are what drives the, the concept of linked open data. Basically, an RDF triple is a sentence. And if you know English grammar, you'll see that the parts of a triple almost line up with the basic parts of an English sentence. So an annotation has a subject, which is like the subject of a sentence, it's a noun. It has an object over here on the other side, which is also a noun. And then there's a predicate that connects the two. The predicate is the part of the sentence about the subject that does not include the object in a semantic predicate. It's a little different in a grammar one um, and if there's any grammar pedants out there, slack me, because I finally figured out why they use these terms. So here's an example of that I gave you in an earlier slide. The subject is DSID, this, this is an attribute at identifier, DSID 01, attribute one. The predicate contains measurements of type, net ecosystem exchange. And so each of those is identifying one part of the RDF. And each of those comes from part of the attribute description. So that's the triple showing where each part comes from in the EML attribute description. The attribute ID, the predicate, and the object. So this, has, this example has used the labels to construct the triple so it's easy for humans to read. A computer would use the URIs and it would look more like this. And here's a similar example from a data set level annotation. We used a different predicate, 
so we're using the data set ID, is about a forest biome. So here's just a short summary. Your property URI will become the predicate in a semantic statement, and the value URI will become the um, object. And the subject of the, is the parent element of the annotation, and so this is why it has to have an ID. So it could be the subject in an RDF triple. So a little bit about the current support of EML22 annotations in repositories. I'm just going to give you a few examples of, of um, how, how repositories are handling this. Um, this is uh, kind of the repositories that we work most closely with and with respect to their support. So the Arctic Data Center repository was involved very early. In fact, it had a supplement from NSF to um, add annotation, and then actually drove a lot of the work that I'm describing for you today, especially for attribute annotations. So if you were to go to the IDC portal, this is the view you would see that you can now search data sets based on an annotation. And it actually is um, querying the, on the uh, ontology vocabulary itself to get some, whoops, to get some, inf some information about the term. Um, this um, capability in EML is fairly new, but it was greatly anticipated by the LTR community. And so annotated data sets are appearing already. So here's the search that you would run at data one. And you can see here that from the uh, LTER member network or from EDI, there are a handful of data sets that are annotated. Uh, they're annotated with measurement types. There are all, also some additional ones that are annotated at the data set level. <clears throat> Oops. So also if you were to go to data one and, do, and run a search like that, you would see um, when you get to the data set level, you would see that it also gives you additional information about that measurement in the view of a data set. So at EDI, we are still planning for how to handle this new feature. So far, we've adapted our EML style sheets, which display um, HTML uh, from the uh, data package metadata to show the contents of an annotation and, a, and link out to the full description. Um, and we're planning to use the pop-up widget sometime in the future. Um, it'll be as a component of some other general um, improvements that we have. So we're using the display at two levels, the data set level and the attribute level. Now, I should also mention that there are other systems that can hold things like measurement URIs besides EML annotations. And this is how a URI would appear in a Darwin Core archive. This is the form that, uh, the format that GBIF uses for um, biodiversity data. So in that system, a URI goes into a column labeled measurement ID here, and <clears throat> we're using it for a measurement of cells per liter. So EDI is planning to create GBIF, uh, data sets for GBIF using its EcoComDB design pattern, and we will use measurement ID in this column when we, uh, when we get to that point. Um, other metadata formats like ISO, uh, or the, or that I, not, I have not an expert on this at all, but I'm, I'm pretty sure they hold structure, or they have structures for holding external URIs. And if any of you are experts, I'd love to get some input for you on where those actually belong. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about what these URAs come from. And this is uh, kind of the intro to ontologies or vocabularies in general. <clears throat> so this is a kind of a graph of a, a spectrum of vocabularies. There's many different types of standalone vocabularies and they have different strengths. You can say that they fall on a spectrum where more complex structures will, lead more, will yield more inferential power. All of the examples on this slide could be considered controlled vocabularies because their management is centralized to some degree and it's vetted by a community. Um, and remember, in order to be referenced, uh, each term has to be identified by a URI. So you would start out with a simple list. A community has a list of important terms. They may or may not include definitions. Often these are only captured as text. They might be in papers or editorials or on web pages. So the example in these circles has, has been passed around quite a bit in the biodiversity community and is starting to gain some traction. 
it describes some concepts called essential biodiversity variables. And since most of the terms include definitions, it's moving toward the next step, which would be a glossary. So glossary then is a list of terms with definitions. And the next step up from that would be a taxonomy where the terms are arranged in branches like a Linnaean taxonomy. So in a term taxonomy of animals, you would say, you could say that all bears are mammals because they're on the same branch of a tree. So if you were to search along a taxonomy for mammals, you would expect to get bears too. You'll find a lot of familiar examples in this area, like the Darwin core terms and the CF standard names. Then one step up from that would be a thesaurus, which usually includes synonyms. So animal now is likely to have synonyms like creature or fauna, and you can expect simple relationships among the terms in different branches. So you can say things like carbon is related to photosynthesis, even though in the, the carbon is in the term tree, and in a, excuse me, in the term tree, carbon would be kept in a chemical branch and photosynthesis would be kept in a process branch. Now you can't do that in a simple taxonomy. Um, thesaurus, thesauri are often kept in structures called SCOS, S-K-O-S, which stands for Simple Knowledge Organization Systems. And in SCOS, the relationships that terms are allowed to have are built in. So the last one and most complex is an ontology. Now here are the relationships among terms in different branches can be complex and explicit. So a statement like carbon is related to photosynthesis <clears throat> becomes something more like carbon participates in photosynthesis. Now, those relationships are not built in, the designers have to write them. And with that level of complexity, the vocabulary can be traversed with, with formal computer logic. So building an ontology is a big step up, which can be a bit off-putting. Um, one way to start an ontology is to re-engineer a thesaurus and add complexity and structure over time as needed for this particular purpose. Um, the language used for ontology is OWL, which stands for Web Ontology Language, a little bit rearranged, so it's easy to say. So again, here's some basic differences between these semi-formal vocabula vocabularies in SCOS and ontology in OWL. SCOS then is designed to be a vehicle for representing semi-formal knowledge systems, such as thesaurus, thesauri, and classification schemes. The concepts may be arranged into structures like hierarchies, and there's only a few allowed relationships, and these are built in. They do not have formal semantics, so they can't be reliably interpreted as either formal axioms or even or facts about the world. And they were never intended to be that, in fact. They, the purpose they serve is to provide a convenient intuitive map for some subject domain, which can then be used to aid, in, in, to aid um, organizing and finding objects like data sets. A formal ontology is expressed as a set of axioms and facts which are relationships between its classes. So they are intended to represent a logical view of their domain, and that's logical in the sense that computers can analyze them. So this re-engineering, as I said, can be a fair amount of work um, because a person would want to transform the structure and intellectual content of a thesaurus into a set of formal axioms. And it is both demanding and time consuming. So um, it can be costly. But overall then, you could think of SCOS for categorizing as you would your hard drive or a bookcase. Um, whereas ontologies function more like your brain. They work and reason with concepts and relationships in ways that are close to the way humans perceive interlinked concepts. So one of the most prominent ontologies in environmental sciences is called ENVO for environment ontology. It's specifically designed to support annotations of organisms or biological samples with environmental descriptors. So its uh, main features are terms for biomes, environmental features, and environmental material. It's part of a, a ontology community called the Obo Foundry, or Open Biomedical and Biological Ontologies. Um, and that group's mission is to develop a family of interoperable ontologies that are both logically well-formed and scientifically accurate. Envo has a relatively easy to use system for searching and browsing terms. Here is an example where I searched for one of my favorite terms, kelp. Um, they do have a concept called kelp forest in Envo, which is in the tree for environmental features. And as you see on the left, um, oh, that's on the left. Um, but as a user um, on the right, you can see this, um, excuse me, on the left side of the right 
image, you can see that the hierarchical tree where kelp fall, for, the kelp forest concept falls. And as a user, you, you can safely ignore these higher level um, classes. These are part of the OBO framework. Um, but the interesting part to an annotator is going to be these um, classes that are below uh, the main group called environmental feature. Uh, and here is a more detailed view. Oh, excuse me, wait a minute. You also see, you also see some of this additional term info that the OWL framework lets you include. The definition here is at the top. I think it should be bigger text, but that's just me. Um, and then there's more term info over here in the box on the right. So here is another example, which will be of interest to the LTR community. This is the entry in Envo for the concept forest. Um, this is also an environmental feature, all it's terrestrial, not underwater. Um, but what I want you to see is that Envo is cross-referencing to the LTR vocabulary here. They've used a prefix LTER and an ID right here, LTER colon 212. Um, and this, in this case, that identifier was generated by um, a system called Temetress, which is the, it's just a software that LTR has used to house its vocabulary for several years now. So, but you see in their cross-reference does not depend on the system that houses the LTR vocabulary, but it does depend on it maintaining that identifier 212. Another ontology you will want to know about is this ecosystem ontology or EXO. It describes measurement types that are present in raw data and it uses the uh, OBOE observation and measurement design pattern, which was developed at ENSYS, um, to capture both an entity of interest and the characteristic that was measured. Um, so its intent is to describe measurements by capturing those entity and characteristic, plus it also includes um, the unit, the protocol, and um, I guess it's those four, the characteristic. I got that unit protocol and yeah, that's all four of them. There's four of them. Um, so you see that it imports the Envo ontology for this box labeled entity. We're using terms straight out of Envo for this. We're also using terms from a, another, a second ontology called Kebi, which is uh, an ontology called for chemicals of biological interest. So EXO's current focus is on carbons and associated, carbon and associated measurements. Um, and because of the uh, diversity of, of measurements that we have in data sets, it was just necessary to narrow the scope. So this OBO, OBOE framework then links entities with their characteristics units, units protocols, and context. Um, it's interoperable with the Open Geospatial Consortium's observations and measurements model, and also with some of other um, uh, systems that are out there for observation and sensors, sampling and actuators. Uh, there's one called SOSA that's particularly interesting. And this is an example of the EXO measurement tree. So you see a similar view to the ENVO viewer. Um, and you'll see that the identifier here is a pearl coming from data one. So data one supplies the persistent identifiers for these exo terms. Um, a PERL is designed to resolve much the same way that a DOI does. Uh, here's a more detailed example of another term in exo for net ecosystem exchange. And you'll see the synonyms over here on the right. There's not only synonyms, but there's alternative labels and deciding how to use those is uh, an interesting exercise. And here's an annotation for that last term for uh, a column in a data set of NEE, which is labeled only as uh, NEE, and it actually has a definition that ecosystem exchange, net ecosystem exchange, but we've annotated it with this EXO class for net ecosystem exchange carbon flux. So how do we put all this together? So, um, I'm hoping that I've convinced you that annotating your metadata with external vocabularies is useful and not super complicated. Um, it does involve looking at the vocabularies and understanding how they're put together and picking the right term. But how does that fit into your curation workflow? So we're gonna wanna consider these three kinds of, these three workflows. First, an LTER site 
that typically stores metadata for multiple uses. Data sets are one of them, but they also use that same relational database for websites and project linkages. There might be, we also want to consider an ad hoc workflow where metadata is collected only for data sets. And this is the way data centers often operate um, and EDI is one of those. And finally, there may be data packages where all we have is the existing EML, but we still want to be able to upgrade those with annotations too. And there could be some overlap between these. For example, there may be an LTR site that has EML that it's not database backed. So a lot of you here are LTR sites, I think, and your workflow will look something like this. Um, each site creates EML for hundreds of data sets and the site data manager has a mix of technical and scientific expertise. Uh, metadata goes first into a database and with code you export EML, which you then push into the repository. So how would you get annotations into that workflow? If you're using a database, probably you will want to add them. You'll want to add tables that um, can hold those annotations. And many of you are aware of the core metabase project in the LTER. Um, that relational model is already planning for how to incorporate annotations into a backend system and to get it into their e site EML. So on the right, you see part of the entity relationship diagram for LTER core metabase. Um, and then its metadata can be exported from the database to an EML record and the annotation goes along with it. At the bottom are the two GitHub um, projects housing the metabase and the code. Gastel and Sven sketched out these tables a year or two ago and now Gastel, An, and Li Kui have been using them and testing them out for their own sites. So the LTER, you can tell here that the LTER is focusing its annotation efforts in two areas, the data set level and attribute level. So those are the two examples I showed earlier. So um, an ad hoc workflow looks typically like this. Metadata goes into some templates and then code reads and converts it to EML. So Colin has already adapted the EDI's EML assembly line to handle annotations. And I think we're planning to shake out the kinks later this week. Um, Colin has added another template to hold annotations that's analogous to the other metadata templates. And this code is modular enough that can actually put annotations in any of the allowable spots um, using command line options. And then there's a, this, a, another, um, so the third um, workflow that I want to talk about um, actually isn't typically associated with the Arctic Data Center. They usually use an ad hoc workflow that's similar to EDIs, but I'm using them here to illustrate the last workflow where you plan to annotate existing EML. So the Arctic Data Center was funded by NSF um, with a supplement to annotate data sets in its holding in order to improve searches. And so they have added measurement annotations to hundreds of carbon cycling data sets, having thousands of attributes. So their approach was to augment that EML directly because this was the most efficient way for a group of annotation experts rather than curators to work. Um, and I should mention that those experts are the authors if you go back to the title page on this talk. <clears throat> so that workflow with existing EML, you would create some external annotations here in the middle and then add them back into the EML. And of course, I've oversimplified this diagram. That asterisk there actually represents quite a bit of work. So here's what we actually did to create those annotations. First, to set the scope, we focused just on attribute annotations. This was to get the most return for the amount of work we knew it was going to be. We also focused on carbon measurements. Um, and so the first thing is to identify the data sets. So run queries to find the relevant data sets in the, e, in, the, in the Arctic data center holdings, mainly using plain old string queries because that's all we could do. We extracted the attribute level metadata to a spreadsheet. And then um, you'll see actually building EXO was part of this project. So we designed terms and looked for ontologies to import into EXO. And finally, when we had those URIs for the candidate annotations, we put them back into the spreadsheet. And then we had each other review our work, both for EXO and for how we assigned them to the data set metadata. Okay, so now we can go back to the spreadsheet or back to the workflow. So now we had a batch of annotations in a spreadsheet. We could actually run code to produce EML with annotations. So why am I telling you all this? Um, 
so the, the reason is that in this project for annotating hundreds of data sets, we actually learned a lot about what is an efficient process for handling them. Um, and the tools that we use for the ADC work are all available for other groups as well. The queries that we use to find carbon related data sets, the spreadsheet layout, and even some insert scripts, plus the experts that worked on EXO and on the ADC project know their way around ENVO and EML as well. So the take home from this particular work with the ADC is that if you can consider a group of attributes together, do it. It will actually help if you can compare across data sets and look at different definitions for something that might be similar. This would probably be a good approach for an LTER site. Um, data set level and attribute level annotations have a high return for the amount of work they take. So because they're the most important places for data set discovery and understanding of the, of the values in a table. We also found that the ontology, we know that the ontology will be missing some terms. Um, but most of the, the people who are working with EXO have relationships both with uh, those people managing ENVO and EXO, and so we can address those missing terms. We also have developed some very specific recommendations for what to do if your term is not there. Um, I think I'm gonna save that for later because that is actually getting way down in the weeds. And so ideally, we can bring these ideas to a workshop. So we are planning this workshop now. Um, we're planning for it to be held in late May, co-hosted by the EDI and the Arctic Data Center. Um, the goal, overall goal, is that participants will be able to add annotations to their own workflows. Um, there may be some prep, um, and we can get together for the EDI, during the EDI office hours for that. So what I expect we'll be doing during the workshop is to examine and compare a couple of ontologies, um, primarily ENVO and EXO, pick out candidate concepts from those ontologies to annotate at the data set and attribute level. And then I, a workshop setting means that you can edit and refine your choices with uh, peers and with expert import. Um, and so we want you to be able to export EML in your preferred manner. Um, and ideally that will happen during the workshop too, but it might depend on how prepared we are. Uh, so those of you, I'm not sure if there's anybody on this call from the Arctic LTER sites that actually replicate their data packages over to ADC but uh, you will probably be particularly interested because the ADC work that I described earlier has some annotations already prepared for you to import into your systems. Um, so that might be a bit, of a, a bit of a jump start, and it's also an illustration of how to organize um, a group of annotations across many data sets that then can be imported into a database. Um, this is uh, just some references that I happened to put together. It's by no means comprehensive. The, this talk is scattered with links and examples. So, um, and I have other, other references to provide. Um, and I believe that's about it. Um, I hope, I think I'm done faster than I thought, but that's great. That means there's more time for questions. So, should I stop sharing? Suzanne, you want to take it over? Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. So are there any questions? And please feel free to either um, turn your audio on or post them into the chat window. Or you can just turn on your video and raise your hand too. And that is possible too, of course, yeah. Oh, a lot more people joined. Hey, I see. I see Tim. Maybe silhouette. Yeah, that's and he's got a. I'm lurking in the shadows here. I have a question. I haven't even worn shadows. Yeah, Anne yeah, is here. And Anne, is there. Hi, Anne. <laughs> hey. So uh, I don't think it matters, but just to clarify, in the, these identifiers that you use, does it matter if one person for for the same identifier? Does it matter if one email data set says HTTP and another says HTTPS? Probably not. Um, boy, that's more of a question for Mark. 
because that makes them locators and uh, I guess it depends on whether the um, the source is redirects HTTP to HTTPS. Like if I want to say, you know, are these two attributes the same, measuring the same thing? But why I, would, I, I would say yes if the rest of the identifiers, the rest of the identifiers are exact. <clears throat> One of the things that we've been noticing is that the same concept actually uh, oh, this is going to get complicated. Can, does start to have different identifiers in different systems. And um, from my own point of view, I think that's a problem. Um, that I think it's something we're going to have to address as, as the people making recommendations for which identifiers should you be using. Um, and basically, the shortest answer, I think it's the one that you want your recipient to be able to, con to, be able to consume. Is the identifier you should be using. So it does mean following um, guidelines. Do you have a specific example with one that's HTTP and one that's HTTPS? No, I just noticed in your examples they were all HTTP, whereas on almost everything we do, we have an S on the end. So that could be partly because these are older. Some of these slides I copied older screenshots, and I suspect they'll be HTTPS if they're more modern. I did pull some screenshots from um, a talk from a couple of years ago. Uh, let me see. Am I still sharing? No, I'm not, but I'm presenting. That won't help. Let me find one. Let's look at Envo. I actually could go straight to Envo and see what their identifiers have. Go to the kelp forest here. I'll screen share again in a second here. Oh, except this doesn't give me the identifier. <clears throat> so these, so I'm looking at the Envo page. Here's the page I'm looking at right now. This is the, um, I'll screen share again. Uh, let's see. So here's the identifier here. And yep, they're using an HTTP for their Perl server. Um, I'm assuming that's fine. That, I mean, this is a, a widely used um, ontology um, that they're, if they had, uh, really, Mark, I do need you to help me. H does HTTPS does really default to HTTP if it doesn't find an HTTPS um, enabled server? <laughs> Sorry. Not, not necessarily. It, it really not depends. Not necessarily. Okay. Yeah. It just depends on the web server and how it, you know, it accepts that request, whether or not it's going to redirect to HTTPS. Or okay. Not. Okay. I guess it, it probably comes down to whether whenever you're trying to ask for a given items of a given like carbon flux or whatever, and you want to see is, is this attribute the same as that attribute? Is the Archer Data Center or EDI's user interface going to be comparing just the identifiers for those or is it actually going to be smart enough to consume what is at the end of that identifier? You know, go out and you know, parse this machine readable thing here and then be able to compare. So right now, EDI, all we do, we actually, um, let me find that slide because, come on, give me my screen back. Can't get to my top, there it is. Uh, let's see, let me go back a slide here. What EDI is doing right now is only displaying the contents of an um, element. So um, we did limit the, um, let me go back to screen sharing. So every time I screen share, it covers up my tabs and I can't move around in my browser. This one. So if you were to go to, a, here's a couple of data sets down here, um, BLE 5.2. So these external annotations here are, the simplest thing to do is just get the content of that annotation element and display it. And we created a, like a, like a little mini semantic sentence that says this data set is about marine biome using the contents of the annotation. So yeah. that's a very simple view. 
Um, there's, I think the only logic is that that um, URI should be a Perl. It doesn't put any random, and if you put any other URI in there, it won't display it as an annotation. It'll just display the label and it won't be linkable. Um, these widgets, um, for instance, this widget here, not that one, this one. This widget here is actually going out and consuming the um, entry for that URI at the source. It's reading the entire description from the ontology itself and returning some of the content to you in the, um, in the web interface. And that takes a JavaScript widget and EDI has not implemented one of those yet. Is that, so on this ADC page, is that hooked just into EXO? Or yes. Will it work with, okay. Just it's exo. hooked, well, yes, it's hooked into EXO, but it's hooked into EXO using an API that comes from a, uh, an ontology repository called BioPortal. BioPortal has hundreds of ontologies in it. So ostensibly, the same, um, the same a similar widget could be used for any of the ontologies in BioPortal, which from ADC's point of view and Data One's point of view, since they're linked, um, is probably a good choice for where to go looking for an API to use for ontology content. EDI hasn't gone down that road yet, but I imagine whatever practices we adopt will be very similar. So, so that means that the ontology that you want to be able to use needs to be in one of these places that has an API and that these, um, the repositories are able to support that API. And that's a choice for the repositories to make, which which ones can they handle? And the other place that the using the ontology comes into play is in the search themselves, because the search interface, say both at the Arctic Data Center and Data One, actually uses the ontology structure to present different kinds of um, uh, result sets to you. Um, I think earlier there was, if you go to the Data One webinars, there's a pretty long um, demo of the Data One search interface that's ontology that's driven by Ontology now on their webinar link that um, Mark Schildhauer and I did in January. But that's a whole uh, hour-long webinar of its own, so I couldn't fit all that into this. But it's recorded, and you can see, and you can just go to Data One and and see how it works just by going down, uh, drilling down on, and doing a filter for annotations. Does that answer your question, Tim? Yes, it does. I think the answer is, does HTTP and HTTPS matter? Probably not, because you're, you're actually following the links, so that's great. Yes. Uh, which ontology is Arctis and are using here? In this case, XO, but it, they could be using more. They're, using, and, they're only using XO at the moment. Yeah, for, for this particular uh, you know, user interface yeah. enhancement here. Yeah. But we could use any ontology we wanted in our EML metadata. Like. Uh, you can. <laughs> <laughs> If you have to, I think you should, it would be wise to see what your community is recommending that you use. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think it's practical for a repository like ADC or EDI to support everything out there. There are many, many ontologies. Um, and so we're going to have to be a little bit careful about how we choose which ones to use. But ostensibly, yes, you can put everything in there. It may or may not be able to be consumed by a repository, though. And Margaret, I think one of your key takeaways was that as you're populating these, that you incorporate semantic annotation into your metadata, you should consider a group of attributes together. Can you clarify what you meant by that? So when we looked at the, um, as one of the people who did annotations for the ADC project, um, you, you need a pretty good understanding of the data set in order to annotate it. Um, and sometimes that's not easy to get just from looking at two or three fields of metadata, like the name of a column and the description. Um, the unit helps sometimes. What, I, what we found with the, with, the, with the annotating hundreds of data sets with the Arctic is that if you, if you have a group of data sets that are similar and you put those attributes together, you start to see patterns. Um, you would say, oh, I have this attribute called CO, that well, has the phrase CO2 in it. I've described it three or four different ways, but it turns out they actually all are the same kind of measurement. Um, but until you see them together, you might not realize that. 
Um, now this might be more true for an older LTER site um, with uh, hundreds of data sets that they've been collecting, you know, some of them being legacy than for a, a younger LTER site like you guys. I mean, you've got a, a still on, on fewer than 10 data sets, I think. So, but the SBC um, group has about 200. And I probably say that a third of those have carbon in them. And whether they've all described carbon exactly the same way, so that um, is hard to say. So the other reason I, I say it's, it really helps to put a group of uh, data sets together to annotate is that occasionally, or for ontologies can be a little bit off-putting to traverse. They are pretty complex structures. And even with viewers like the one I showed you for Envo, um, you're, when, you, when you find the, a term that you really want to use, if you could put it in more than one place at one time, it's going to speed up your work overall. So if I, once I find the term for, say, net carbon exchange or net ecosystem exchange carbon flux, and I know, because I know my corpus of data sets pretty well, I think I have 10 data sets that have that measurement in it, it'd be great if I could do them all at once. If I could say the, all of these are going to be annotated with the same measurement because they are equivalent measurements, um, rather than have to go look it up each time I hit a different data set. So that it kind of goes both ways. Look up one thing in the ontology, put it in five places in your database or in your annotation spreadsheet. Plus you get to see all your data set attributes together and you can see how similar they are, whether they truly are the same um, class or whether they should be a little bit different, annotated a little bit differently. Does that help? Yes, it does. If we're interested in this workshop in May, how do we express that interest? We haven't come up with an announcement yet because we're still trying to decide actually where it's going to be held. Um, probably, and we want to hold it the, the, I think it's the last week in late May. I forget exactly what week it is. So there'll be an announcement pretty soon. Yay. And like I said, though, that part of it, I think, especially for LTER sites, there is likely to be some prep because ideally, if there's some um, augmentations you have to make to your backend database, um, if you would do those before, that would be great because then you can get all the way to nice clean EML 2.2 during the workshop. So that might be a different kind of process for each person. And, you know, we can talk about what works and what doesn't work. Um, I know you guys have core metabase already installed, so you probably won't have that. Your prep's already done. Manuel, you mentioned core metabase, and Gastil put a comment in here for Tim in the comment window. Ah, okay. I didn't see okay. the call. Oh, I think I'm still sharing. Yeah, I can go up. Or you can I have a, here. Here's the core metabase slide here. So core metabase, this is the tables that um, Gastel and actually Sven, Sven does not use core metabase, but this is the kind of thing he loves to do. So they got together and planned out what the tables would look like. Um, and I think the similar kind of table would work in another database as well. Um, if you wanted to do annotations of different sorts, this, you would need to have additional cross-references. Gastel, did you, I can't, I can stop sharing, then I can see the comments, wait a minute, okay. Oh, John, can I add, add you, add, you've uh, put in a question, but it's only to me, can I read it aloud? It's, So John asks, when the RDF triple is generated programmatically, how is the subject identified? Is it the ID of the attribute in EML? Yes. And what makes them unique is the uh, EML parser requires that, any, that all IDs be unique within a document. Yeah, I guess uh, my question was, then wouldn't you want, for RDF, wouldn't you want, I mean, the, the uh, predicate and object are unique by virtue of being URIs? Uh, wouldn't you want uniqueness across, you know, global uniqueness, just not with, not just within a, a single EML document? So I think the rest of the global uniqueness is by virtue of it being within a, 
uh, an EML record that itself is globally unique. So if my... So the RDF triple knows what document it came from? Yes, it has okay. to know what document it came from. Okay, thanks. Did I get that right, Bryce? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. The um, EML as a document is going to have a system and a package identifier. And that's, that's the implicit um, sort of root of the subject for all those triples. That's the, that's the GUID or global, global ID for that document. And then, the, and then the attribute or the element ID just drills down into the document itself for this, yeah. the rest of the subject. Did you have a question or comment? Yeah, I do, but this may be way too far into the weeds. So the first thing that when I start looking at, at ontologies is that I would like to kind of split this out into things like, well, it was this compound and it was a concentration and it was in water and not in air or in soil. And so I wonder, is there a way to document that? Or do I have to find the ontology term that says it's nitrogen concentration in water, in fresh water? So those are, those are, how can I put this? Those are features of the OBO, the OBOE framework that it's, that there's context entities, like it's, you can have multiple entities that you can have. Um, you measure nitrogen in seawater. Um, I have to confess that we haven't, the measurements that are defined so far, we haven't gotten every one of those axioms written. So, but it is one term that will do yes. nitrogen concentration in fresh water. So the way, yes, but, and that, that term, nitrogen concentration in fresh water, would it probably have a sibling nitrogen concentration in seawater, mm -hmm. um, and it would have a parent nitrogen concentration in water. So if you had nitrogen in groundwater or in an estuary or it didn't fit one of the subclasses, you can go up to the parent class. And that's the recommended thing to do is if, you're, if you can't find exactly the term, but you're in a hierarchy, you can default to the parent. And that will still be correct because it's still nitrogen in water it's just that we haven't done a good job of identifying where that water is. So it will always have to be just one term. It's not like annotations yes. will have several terms. Like you, you actually can do that. And if you, um, those get actually much more complex and I didn't want to cover them here. But I think that there are, there's some examples if you look at the, um, if you, when you could do this, you check out the EML schema and look at the example docs for semantics, you will see some much more complex annotations that people have tested with where each of the, where they actually do exactly that. They say, it's, this is nitrogen, it has characteristic concentration, it's from fresh water, and there's a stack of three or four annotations on a single attribute. That, it would make a lot more sense to me, rather than having these it's, giant ontologies that have And it's entire, it basically means you're constructing all those relationships as you annotate, and it's entirely possible to do. Um, I haven't done it myself, and I haven't figured out a good way to keep track of all those pieces in the kinds of systems that we have, <coughs> excuse me, typically in LTER sites. So that's why we were depending on the um, ontology doing that part for us. But it's certainly, it'll, you can do that with EML, yes. I can pull up an example if you wanna wait, but it's getting late enough. I think this is like a, something we should go into. But that's typically the way um, that's the way Matt likes to annotate, and those are his examples that have that are done that way. But what it means is you, as an annotator, have to know instead of just knowing one ontology that's constructed it for you, you have to know all the relationships of those components yourself. Yeah. So it's a bit more puts more of the responsibility on you and less on the vocabulary. Yep.
thank you.